Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started because it is 7.30, so I'm sure there will be people jumping on and joining over the next few minutes, but if you're here, then you can look at the review on the screen. This is something that you've seen, uh, the same thing, haven't changed it, copied and pasted uh, this same review slide over the last several classes. These are verses that I think encapsulate the message of Jeremiah. They're good phrases, good verses to have in mind when thinking back on the message of Jeremiah. And so spend a couple minutes here uh, as we have people continue to join us. Um, we'll go silent here and just uh, stare at this for 60 seconds or so and see if you can fill in the blanks of these verses without looking at the text. And uh, we'll go over them quickly before getting into uh, the second half of chapter 15 in just a minute. Okay, uh, let's look at these, and hopefully you're yelling these out at home. Probably gave you too long. Hopefully these are uh, implanted in your brain. You know them uh, right off the bat. But uh, the first one from chapter 2, They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out for themselves broken cisterns. I guess there's no point in me waiting on you to respond. Uh, broken cisterns that hold no water. Um, again, um, showing the contrast between what God offers and what these people have sought out for themselves. Uh, they, heal, they have healed, they being the false prophets. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, Jeremiah says, saying, peace, peace, where there is no peace. Uh, important um, contrast again, this time between what the true prophet Jeremiah was saying uh, which is that there is destruction coming upon Jerusalem at the hand of the Babylonians from the north. But uh, you have all these false prophets claiming to be prophets of Jehovah, prophesying in his name, they claim, uh, saying, no, everything's going to be fine. So they heal the wound lightly, saying, peace, peace. Okay, Jeremiah's uh, better offer in chapter 16, just two verses later, if you will look for the ancient paths and walk in the good way, then you will find rest for your souls. Um, again, something that uh, language that Jesus picks up on, and uh, this is kind of the the ultimate benefit of uh, being faithful to God. And maybe we can see that in contrast to the immediate punishment that is coming upon them. Okay, Jeremiah uh, asks, uh, says in his temple sermon in chapter seven, has this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers, a den of thieves? in your sight, calling them out for uh, living wickedly and then hiding, so to speak, in the temple, thinking that they are safe there uh, from the wrath of God because they have his temple in their midst. Um, Jeremiah says that's not the way it works. Okay, uh, chapter 9, verse 24, let him who boasts, remember, don't boast in wisdom, might, wealth, boast in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord who exercises steadfast love, justice, and righteousness, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. And then in chapter 10, I know, O Lord, Jeremiah says, uh, understanding the just nature of God's wrath, I, under I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his steps. Um, Jeremiah sees the folly of, um, of the people around him that have gone after their own desire, uh, getting back even to our first uh, fill-in-the-blank, full circle here, uh, gone after their own desire and left the will of God behind. Um, okay, uh, we'll try to add more of these. Every time I kind of look back, and I'm, I'm looking for, for big highlight verses as we go uh, to add to our list. So at some point we'll add more to this as we're getting farther into the book. Uh, but for now, if you can know these, even these, I think, give a really good picture of the message of the book, at least up to this point. But tonight we are looking at chapters 15 and 16. And so you can have your Bible open. Um, again, I uh, sent out the handout. There's actually three handouts on the back printer. Um, well, these are, I sent them there this afternoon, so um, they should be there. If not, there was an error in the printing process. But if you're at home, maybe you're able to print the handout I sent out earlier by email or um, even just access it on your device. And I'm sure some of you have figured out the fancy way to have it on a tablet and write on it yourself. Um, but that's beyond uh, what I would be able to do. So I stick to printing and uh, filling it out with a pen or pencil. 
Um, but have your Bible open as we look at Jeremiah 15, and we're going to be starting around verse 10 and going to the end, hopefully tonight, of chapter 16. Uh, before we do that, I did want to uh, just mention something. Um, we, had, we had mentioned before about people that had sent cards uh, during this time, especially. It's nice to hear from people and, and hear the good wishes uh, that people are, are sending to uh, us as their brothers and sisters in the congregation. This is a little bit different, but um, we want to continue to remember the family of John Hart. So Lucille Hart and uh, the Arechigas, Albert and Patty, uh, and their kids. Uh, with John's passing, uh, and the, really the recent past, as, as slow as time has gone in the last uh, month or so, uh, this is still fresh, John's passing. Um, and I just wanted to note that, you know, there is an individual fund uh, that we, um, as again, just uh, uh, individuals as needed, contribute to, uh, usually to, to send flowers to the funeral of somebody. But in this case, the family had asked for uh, that fund um, to, be, to be donated to uh, Sacred Selections, which, as you know, is very important to me. Uh, Sacred Selections funds Christian adoptions and has helped Beth and I in uh, bringing Asher home and uh, making him part of our family and um, anyway, just uh, there's a card here from Sacred Selections, uh, just noting that they have received that donation. Um, and so, again, to the individuals of this congregation uh, that have contributed to that over time and managed that and, and helped to get those funds distributed. I think Barbara plays an a integral role in that. Um, but uh, just knowing that, one, um, I appreciate personally that. I know the family um, Lucille and Patty and the family really appreciate uh, that, and um, knowing that, that that effort has been completed, um, and also to remind us to continue to pray for the family as they mourn, and maybe especially in this difficult time, deal with an extra layer of, of loneliness and sorrow as they adjust to multiple things, including um, missing their dear John. So I um, just wanted to m mention that before we officially got started. Let's jump in here. Uh, there may be time, if we have it at the end, to talk about uh, some, some things that we've reviewed in the past. But uh, for now, let's just jump straight in. Let's Picking up in chapter 15 and verse 10. Um, and do remember that there was somewhat in our, in our previous class in, on Sunday, we saw that in chapters 14 and 15, there was a bit of a conversation going back and forth, uh, really between the people and God. And we noticed how Jeremiah himself is voicing some of those uh, concerns or some of those pleas of the people. And we're going to see more of that same format in chapter 15, uh, continuing in 15 and going into 16. But this time, really noting Jeremiah's own personal complaints or mournings or lamentations and how God answers the problems that Jeremiah himself is expressing so a similar format, but focusing more on Jeremiah's um, trouble as opposed to the trouble of the people in general. Um, but notice that as we go and see some of the back and forth here. And let's read from Jeremiah fifteen ten to the end of the chapter. Woe to me, my mother, that you have borne me as a man of strife and a man of contention to all the land. I have not lent. Nor have men lent money to me, yet everyone curses me. The Lord said, Surely I will set you free for purposes of good. Surely I will cause the enemy to make supplication to you in a time of disaster and a time of distress. Can anyone smash iron, iron from the north or bronze? Your wealth and your treasures I will give for booty without cost, even for all your sins and within all your borders. Then I will cause your enemies, thank you, cause your enemies to bring it into a land you do not know. For a fire has been kindled in my anger. It will burn upon you. You who know, O Lord, remember me. Take notice of me and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. Do not, in view of your patience, take me away. Know that for your sake I endure reproach. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became for me a joy and a delight of my heart. For I have been called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. I did not sit in the circle of merrymakers, 
nor did I exult. Because of your hand upon me, I sat alone, for you filled me with indignation. Why has my pain been perpetual and my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Will you indeed be to me like a deceptive stream with water that is unreliable? Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, I will restore you. Before me, you will stand. And if you extract the precious from the worthless, you will become my spokesman. They, for their part, may turn to you. But as for you, you must not turn to them. Then I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. And though they fight against you, they will not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, declares the Lord. So I will deliver you, declares the, uh, so, so I will de deliver you from the hand of the wicked. And I will redeem you from the grasp of the violent. Okay, there's quite a bit here, and again, we see the back and forth happening several times, and so let's try to keep track. It's often hard in poetry of the Bible, including the prophets. Uh, oftentimes, the speaker will just uh, switch, and you're not always alerted to that, and you have to pick up on the context of uh, what's being said to understand who it is that's speaking, and so let's try to follow that as we go through. Um, we begin, I think, pretty clearly by identifying Jeremiah as the speaker because we have another statement of mourning, of lamentation, and a, a fairly extreme one. Uh, Jeremiah is one of really just a few um, figures in the Old Testament that will either directly at some point ask for his life to be taken, right? Just, just end it right now, God. Of course, that's never the answer. Uh, but sometimes like this, and we see similar language in, the, in Job, uh, just mourning their own birth, saying, why, you know, that this is just an awful thing that I was born. In this case, addressing his mother. Woe to me, my mother, um, that, that you have borne me. And notice what he says here. He says, I am a man of strife and contention. It's like uh, conflict surrounds Jeremiah. Um, doesn't get along with anybody. Everybody's out to get him. We've actually seen that in the book so far. But why? And Jeremiah says, it's not anything that I've done, at least not anything that I have done bad, he says. Uh, he mentions lending and borrowing money. Uh, the, those, both of those have got to be really high up on the list of things that cause squabbles and fights and trouble amongst people, uh, lending and borrowing money. But Jeremiah says, I, I didn't do any of that. Yet everyone curses me. We know the reason. And Jeremiah implies the reason here. And we'll say it more directly in a little bit. He's a man of contention, a man of strife. Everyone's out to get him because he is preaching God's word. And so God responds to that. And uh, does it at this point give him a message of encouragement? I think uh, verse 11 is a little bit tricky in the way that it's worded. But he seems to say that I will set you free. That's a message of deliverance, I think. He says, your enemies will make supplication to you. Uh, there is somewhat of a question of who are his enemies. Um, I tend to think that his enemies in this case are, are his fellow countrymen that we've read about in previous chapters that are out to get him. And in that case, God would be saying, they're against you now. But he says, uh, they will make supplication to you in a time of disaster. They'll come back, Jeremiah. They'll come to you eventually. And, uh, and they will recognize uh, that they need your help. Uh, but there's also a possibility that these enemies are the Babylonians. And we do see evidence later in the book that Jeremiah is even um, consulted by the Babylonians uh, when they invade the city of Jerusalem. But either way, it's a message of deliverance. And in the rest of this section, uh, from 12 to 14 at least, there is another reiteration of the judgment. This is one of those things that when you're becoming familiar with the book of Jeremiah— Okay, you're learning the language, learning any new book um, uh, in the Bible or otherwise. You're, you're learning kind of the way the author speaks. You're learning to pick up on clues. And uh, in this case, your clue should be in verse 12, from the north. Okay? And we've seen that over and over again, and we should register that immediately to say, okay, this is the destruction from Babylon, spoken of over and over again as coming from the north going back all the way to chapter 1 in the boiling pot, okay? 
And so we can read 12 to 14 as a, a reiteration of the judgment God is bringing at the hand of the Babylonians. And uh, basically it's, it's, it's sure and certain and complete. It's like iron. You're going to go uh, in hand-to-hand -hand combat with iron, try to smash it. Uh, God is going to destroy the land and give away the treasures of the land to these invaders. Okay, so this is the first back and forth. Uh, Jeremiah lamenting God, uh, reiterating um, his, his help for Jeremiah as well as the judgment coming on these people that are making life so miserable for the prophet. But as we keep going in chapter 15, um, this ramps up a little bit, this conversation between Jeremiah and God. And uh, hopefully you notice that in verses 15 to 17, Jeremiah is outright complaining and laying his trouble, blaming his trouble, uh, if you will, on God. He's laying this at God's feet. And he is calling out to God, of course, remember me, take vengeance, okay? He says at the end of verse 15, know that for your sake, I endure reproach, okay? What does he mean by that exactly? Um, notice he says uh, in verse 16 and 17, right, that I ate your words, I took delight in them, I'm called by your name, verse 17, I did not sit with the merrymakers, because of your hand upon me, I sat alone because you filled me with indignation. See, Jeremiah is making very clear that as he's trying to be faithful and he is suffering for that, that's on God. God, you're the reason I'm doing this. And this is how it's turning out. I'm lonely. I am uh, rejected. I am ostracized by my own people. And he says um, in verse 18, with the imagery of a stream bed that is dry, even deceptive, okay? Um, I've never been on a hike long enough uh, for this to come into play, I guess. Uh, but my dad's been hiking and backpacking a lot recently. And he's, uh, re uh, I guess over the last summer, they'd gone on a hike where they had b uh, counted on there being water. But all the streams that they knew of on the map, they were all... Uh, they were either all dried up or all frozen. I can't remember which one it was. I think the first time they were all dried up. How disappointing that you're counting on water being there and it's not there. And if we notice in verse 18, Jeremiah is using that imagery, that language to talk about God. He's saying, God, I, I was counting on you being there, but when I needed you the most, it was just deceptive, okay? And he says, my, my, uh, the water is unreliable. It's, that's quite the accusation against God. You've been unreliable towards me, God. I, I needed you and you weren't there. And he says, my wound was incurable. Interesting uh, how that language has been used previously about Israel and their circumstance. And now Jeremiah, uh, of his own trouble, says, my wound is incurable. Okay. Uh, just for fun... There seems to be a, a little bit of a reference or maybe you could say an echo or an allusion to Psalm 1. Um, notice that Jeremiah says, I've been eating up your words. Remember that the, the focus of, Jerem, uh, of Psalm 1, excuse me. The focus of, of Psalm 1 is uh, those who meditate on the law of the Lord. They delight in it day and night. He says here, your words were my delight. Uh, remember in Psalm 1 that the righteous person not only delights in the word of God and meditates on them day and night, but he also keeps himself from evil. Specifically, Psalm 1 says, uh, I, I, uh, those are, wicked are those who sit in the seat of scoffers, but the righteous are not so. They're not like that. And Jeremiah says here, I didn't sit in, I think some translations even say, the seat of scoffers. And yet, remember in Psalm 1, it says that the righteous... Uh, the person that keeps himself from the wicked and meditates on God's word will be like a tree planted by streams of water. I wonder if Jeremiah has this in mind and is saying, I've been meditating on your word. I've kept myself from the seat of scoffers. And am I being planted by streams of water? No. All I have is a deceptive stream that doesn't have any water. It's unreliable. Again, uh, he is clearly complaining clearly uh, uh, voicing his difficulty and clearly um, accusing, if, if you don't want to use that strong of a term, 
uh, giving credit to God as the source of his difficulty because he's trying to do God's work. Okay, uh, let's see how God responds here. Um, interestingly, in verse 19, the word return is used. So maybe you don't like me using the word repent. Um, but you know that in the prophets, the prophets will oftentimes say to the people, if you return to me, I will return to you. Okay, that's a message of repentance. God says to Jeremiah, if you will return, I will restore you. To me, this is an indication that Jeremiah is out of line to some degree. Okay, this, these, are, these are difficult, uh, difficult things here. Um, to know exactly uh, these things that are recorded, what's acceptable for God, what's not. Um, we've mentioned this before, but it's similar to what you find in the book of Job. Remember, Job is, is very free with his tongue in the book of Job to say all kinds of things about God and what God has done to him. And uh, while God doesn't um, necessarily come out and say, Job, you've sinned. In fact, the book says that Job did not sin with his lips. Job does repent at the end of the book. He says, I repent in sackcloth and ashes for all these things that I've, I've, I've said and, and, and how I've totally missed uh, what's going on here. Um, so we might say something similar about Jeremiah, that we understand his complaint. We are sympathetic to the difficulty that Jeremiah faces. Uh, but we do want to note that God says, Jeremiah, you need, to, you need to get it together here. He goes on to say uh, uh, in verse 19, If you extract the precious from the worthless, you will become my spokesman. Okay. Um, I really like that phrase. If you extract the precious from the worthless. What I think of in thinking of Jeremiah is that Jeremiah has all these emotions, all these difficulties, all these things that he's wrestling with. And God wants Jeremiah to pull out of that what is good and leave behind what is, is bad. Okay. Um, so Jeremiah is coming to God, for example. Jeremiah is voicing this complaint to God. He's not going around Jerusalem saying, God deserts us, God forsakes us, uh, woe is me, and, and you know, don't trust in God because he'll just leave you uh, disappointed. Jeremiah's not doing that. He's going to God with his concern. And so we could say, well, that's good. That's a good thing that Jeremiah is relying and depending on God. So extract, extract that. And if there are elements in Jeremiah's complaint here of, uh, self-pity, um, and some of the, the harmful and negative things, the things that Satan tries to whisper to us in our difficult moments to say, you know, God's turning his back on you, and, uh, you know, that you're, you're just, you're, you're hopeless, you're helpless, you can't, uh, you can't make it, you're not strong enough to get through this difficulty. Leave all that behind. Extract the, the, extract the precious from the worthless, and you can be, he says, my spokesman. And he goes on to, I think this is also significant, he goes on to remind him in verses 20 and 21 of what he had already told him back when he called him in chapter 1. So he tells him, I'll make you bronze, uh, and I will strengthen you so that they will not prevail against you. Very same thing said when he called him, called Jeremiah in chapter 1 and said, it's going to be hard, but I'm going to strengthen you. These people will not overcome you. Okay. So uh, think of this for yourself. We've already spent more time on this section than I intended. Um, but when things are difficult for us, we tend, like Jeremiah, uh, towards oftentimes we tend towards self-pity, feeling sorry for yourself. And uh, that's not always the best thing. And uh, these are the words of God. So uh, he obviously knows exactly what Jeremiah needs to hear. Um, and uh, But sometimes it may be the case that we need to hear these same thoughts as well. Um, to say, hey, you need to, you, need to, you need to get this together, okay? And you need to continue to keep yourself pure from the world. Don't let the world, don't let Satan drag you in, uh, in this time of, uh, of feeling sorry for yourself, wallowing around. Uh, remember who you are, so to speak. Uh, get it together. Remember what I told you. Go back to the Word, read it, remind yourself of the instructions and the promises of God. And then, um, you know, buck up and uh, get to work, so to speak. Okay, we saw some of that before. Remember, uh, if you tire out running with men, how will you run with horses? Speaking of, uh, notice what God says to Jeremiah as we begin chapter 16. You thought it was hard. Uh, now, well, notice what God tells Jeremiah in the first nine verses of chapter 16. He says, The word of the Lord also came to me, saying, You shall not take a wife. 
for yourself, nor have sons or daughters in this place. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters born in this place and concerning their mothers who bear them and their fathers who beget them in this land, they will die of deadly diseases. They will not be lamented or buried. They will be as dung on the surface of the ground and come to an end by sword and famine and by carcasses and their carcasses will become food for the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth. For thus says the Lord, do not enter a house of mourning or go to lament or to console them, for I have withdrawn my peace from this people, declares the Lord, my loving kindness and my compassion. Both great men and small will die in this land. They will not be buried, they will not be lamented, nor will anyone gash himself or shave his head for them. Men will not break bread in mourning for them to comfort anyone for the dead, nor um, give them a cup of consolation to drink for anyone's father or mother. Moreover, you shall not go into a house of feasting to sit with them and to eat and drink. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am going to eliminate from this place before your eyes and in your time the voice of rejoicing and the voice of gladness, the voice of the groom and the voice of the bride. Okay, uh, Jeremiah is told to uh, do some social distancing. I, I know it's really lame, but I, I just couldn't help myself. Right. It was just it was right there. I'm a dad now. You know, all these puns and these, you know, corny jokes are just coming to mind. So I went for it. So hopefully uh, you're not offended by that, by the insensitive insensitivity or the lameness of that joke. Uh, either one. But he tells him to um, abstain from certain normal and I would say we would note important social customs. So let's talk about each of these very briefly. And I think once we start talking about it. It'll, you know, they're all kind of in the same category to some degree. Jeremiah is told not to have a family, not to marry, not to have children. Um, just maybe we could just stop uh, before we go any further to the message of this text and just say, uh, this is another one of the difficulties, I guess we would say Jeremiah had to deal with. And think about the fact that he had just complained at the end of chapter 15 about being lonely, right? I'm by myself. People aren't... Uh, you know, accepting me. They're rejecting me. And so on top of that, you're lonely, Jeremiah. Well, uh, don't get married and don't have children. Um, and, and the prophets were often asked to do things that were hard. Um, and this would be one of them. And uh, we'll maybe say something more about that in just a second. But notice the reason why Jeremiah is not to be married or have a family. And it's because families aren't going to be around much longer, God says. He says, you know, mothers and fathers and children, they're all going to be wiped out. Jeremiah, because of what's around the corner, um, you're, you're not, not going to have a family because that, that represents. And that's, I think, part of what's going on here. Uh, these commands, are, I think, maybe in part are for Jeremiah and for his benefit in some way uh, or for his um, uh in order to navigate this society he lives in, in a godly way. But I think these actions are largely symbolic of the situation, right? And so uh, I can just maybe just go ahead and, and, and I was going to say this for a little bit later, but uh, as a parallel example, um, Hosea, right? Um, Hosea was told to marry a prostitute. What was the point of that? Well, the point was to symbolize something greater. The point was to symbolize God's relationship with Israel. So I think these actions here in chapter 16, while maybe benefiting Jeremiah to some degree, are intended to uh, be symbolic, to represent something, although he was supposed to really do these things, but that they were uh, an act that showed something greater. So don't be married and have a family. That is representative of the fact that, that uh, women men and children are going to be wiped out in this destruction. Don't go to funerals, he says. Don't gather in the house of mourning, right? And again, symbolically, uh, that, that literal action represents the fact that there, there aren't people to engage in the funeral rites. Not people to mourn, not people to uh, bury um, the person, not people even to make a meal for the people that are mourning, um, and so 
uh, again, this, this desolation that is coming informs Jeremiah to just stay away from this activity altogether. And a similar statement is made about celebrations. The joy and gladness will be removed. Okay, um, I feel like I'm not explaining that super well. Um, but uh, I think the point is that, again, Jeremiah abstaining from these things that are, that are part of normal, everyday life, marriages, funerals, celebration, uh, having a family, Jeremiah abstaining from these things is a sign that things are not normal in Judah and in Jerusalem, that right around the corner, normal life is going to come to a complete end, when uh, the Babylonians come in very shortly, destroy the city, take all the people into captivity. And so Jeremiah detaching himself is, uh, is a way to signify to the people what is about to happen. Okay, I felt better about that explanation than the previous one. Um, but either way, this is going to be strange to, uh, to, to the people that see this. You know, uh, why, why aren't you married, Jeremiah? Why, aren't you, why don't you have a family? Um, why aren't you going to this funeral? Maybe people would even be offended. You're not going to come to my party. You're not going to come to my, to my funeral. Uh, you're not going to come to the funeral of my loved one. Okay. Um, Jeremiah was going to stand out, maybe even draw the ire of some by doing this. But again, uh, th- this, this was his charge as a, as a prophet. And again, I think I've, I've uh, used up too much of my uh, spare time in commentating in uh, previous verses. But there is a sense, obviously, we are not called in, uh, in, it, you know, by, by God to not be married or to not go to funerals. In fact, we're kind of commanded to go to funerals. Ecclesiastes says it's better to do that than go to, go to parties. Or, you know, we're not told not to go to celebrations. But I was thinking about this a little bit, and it is true that because, because we know that uh, um, this world is not our home, so to speak. We use that, we use that phrase, but, remember, but Jesus said, you know, you are in the world, but not of the world. There is a sense of detachment that we have. Uh, it doesn't mean we're not involved in the world. And in fact, I want to, there's going to be a really important principle later on in the book of Jeremiah about what it means to live in exile. And it doesn't mean that you're totally isolated, totally detached, care nothing about uh, where you live. But uh, there is, I think, intention with that. Um, there is a sense that we do uh, detach ourselves, uh, abstain from just carrying on. Remember the, the descriptions of, of the evil world before the judgment, right? Marrying and giving and marrying and celebrating and eating and drinking like in the days of Noah. Uh, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, eat and drink and be married tomorrow you die. Um, we, we know better than that. And so we do abstain from many things in the world and even live uh, different lives because of our sober-mindedness, no matter how strange that may make us look in the eyes of others. Okay. Um, all right, let's keep going here. And uh, we are kind of continuing to uh, that, that theme of the destruction that's coming upon the people in Judah and Jerusalem. And so let's read the rest of our chapter here from verse 10 to 21. Now, when you tell this people all these words, they will say to you, For what reason has the Lord declared all this great calamity against us? And what is our iniquity, or what is our sin, which we have committed against the Lord? Then you are to say to them, It is because your forefathers have forsaken me, declares the Lord, and have followed other gods, and served them, and bowed down to them. But me they have forsaken, and have not kept my law. You too have done evil even more than your forefathers. For behold, you are each one walking according to the stubbornness of his own evil heart. Without listening to me. So I will hurl you out of this land into the land which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers. And there you will serve other gods night and day. For I will grant you no favor. Verse 14. Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord. When it will no longer be said, as the Lord lives, who brought up the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of the north and from all the countries where he had banished them. For I will restore them to their own land, which I gave to their fathers. Behold, verse 16, I am going to send for many fishermen, declares the Lord, and they will fish for them. And afterwards, I will send for many hunters and they will hunt them from every mountain and every hill 
and from the clefts of the rock. For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my face, nor is their iniquity concealed from my eyes. I will first doubly repay their iniquity and their sin, because they have polluted my land. They have filled my inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable idols and with their abominations. Verse 19. O Lord, my strength and my stronghold, and my refuge in the day of distress, for to you the nations will come from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited nothing but falsehood, futility, and things of no profit. Can man make gods for himself? Yet they are not gods. Therefore, behold, I am going to make them know, this time I will make them know, my power and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. Okay, um, several things here, and we want to note, especially some of these messages that are more rare so far in the book of Jeremiah. What's not rare, what's very common, is this first exchange. Uh, why, are the, why is this happening to us? God says when they ask you that. Again, this is not genuine ignorance. Uh, this is willful ignorance. This is the tendency we all have to say, well, what do you mean? I, I didn't do anything. It's not my fault. Okay. Um, but God says to Jeremiah, well, remind them not only of the, the wickedness of their fathers. Because okay? remember, the, the punishment, we've, we've spent more time talking about this, I think, on Sunday. Um, by the time of Jeremiah, the destruction of Judah, the destruction of Jerusalem, this is generations of unfaithfulness that has built up in Israel and in Judah. Okay, So he says, well, your fathers were wicked, but you, he says, are even worse. Okay, And I wonder if he says specifically, he says, this is a very common phrase in, in Jeremiah, you, each one walks after the stubbornness of his own evil heart without listening to me. Okay. Um, I think as each generation progresses, uh, we see in the Old Testament, um, stubbornness becomes more and more the issue because they just continue to refuse to listen. Uh, maybe that happens to us too. That uh, maybe each, gener each generation, if we are taught uh, the, the, the ways of the Lord, um, but yet we turn from it, it's not because we didn't know it, it's because we have willfully decided to to forsake it. Or in our life, the longer we go without fixing sin and, and, and continue to uh, reject God in certain areas of our life, it's just more and more stubbornness. And that's what Jeremiah says of these people. And so God will hurl. Uh, it's pretty, I don't think it's like hurl, like, uh, you know, uh, that's a modern usage of the word, I think. Um, but he will hurl them, throw them out of the land, and uh, give them over to those gods that they served um, when they were in the land. Okay, about five minutes left here, so uh, let's notice some of, the, some of the things said in the rest of this chapter that we haven't seen as much of before. There is a glimpse of the future in verse 14 and 15. I think this is mostly hopeful, okay? Uh, you could read this and, and say that this is a, a bittersweet message of hope because he says, um, oh, let's note what he says first. He says, people aren't going to say anymore, you know, the Lord who brought them up out of the land of Egypt. You remember that that's, that is the event that Israel was always referring back to in their history. Remember when God led us out of Egypt, okay? He says that won't be the thing anymore, that that won't be the turning point. In the future, people will say the God who brought them back, who delivered them from the land of the north and all the other lands where they were scattered, okay? The message is just like the God delivered the people from Egypt, he's going to deliver the people from this captivity as well. Now, there's a, the bittersweet in that is that the captivity is going to happen. Remember, the people in Jeremiah's day were denying that. So this is a reminder that, yes, you are going into captivity after all. Okay, don't forget that. But there is a message of hope because he says in verse 15, I will restore them to their own land, which I gave to their fathers. So there is a glimmer of what will happen after the captivity and Jeremiah will say more about that later in the book. But in the meantime, we have the present moment. And again, there's so many creative images in the prophets, especially. Uh, we've seen a lot in Jeremiah. Um, God is going to appoint people to go fishing and to go hunting, okay? Uh, to get their gear on, you know, all their camo and their, you know, face paint. I don't know why you have to paint your face when you're going hunting, but... 
you know, get your tackle box, get ready and go out. And uh, I think it's a little bit interesting when you're reading it in order, it almost sounds like these are going out to find people to bring them back from captivity because he had just said that, that they will come back. But as you keep reading in 16 to 18, it's clear that he is, these people are being hunted. These people are being sought out uh, so that God can repay them for their iniquity. Okay, so in the future, there will be return. But in the meantime, God is not going to let Judah off the hook. That's a poor mixing of metaphors there. Uh, God is not going to let Judah get away with their sin, their rebellion, their unfaithfulness. And so, maybe a picture of the Babylonian soldiers going throughout the countryside, hunting, seeking out under every rock, uh, in every pond, uh, on every hill, finding the people and dragging them off into captivity. Fishermen and hunters seeking for those uh, to bring God's punishment upon each and every person uh, in, in Judah and Jerusalem. But, with two minutes left here, perfect timing, um, the last statement, or last uh, um, section in this chapter, is maybe the most beautiful. We already saw one glimmer of hope, which is the people would return. Um, so after the punishment, after the retribution, there will be that hope of returning. But we end with another picture of hope, which is that the nations, Jeremiah says, the nations will realize their futility. This is just a beautiful statement in verse 19. Jeremiah seems to be saying, first of all, you see Jeremiah reiterating, going back to that kind of riff that Jeremiah and God had earlier. Uh, Jeremiah seems to be bringing, uh, coming before God saying, you are my strength and my stronghold. He trusts God. He's not going to forsake him. You are my refuge in time of distress. He says, to you the nations will come and say, Our fathers inherited nothing from false, but falsehood, futility and things of no profit. Can man make God for himself? They are not God. This is the point that God has been impressing, trying to impress on his people forever. You can go back to uh, chapter 10, right? The satire about idolatry. You know, you bring the idol into the house, you got to nail it into the floor so it doesn't topple over. And God's the one that shakes the whole earth with thunder, like we experienced last night. Silly to worship these idols. God's been trying to tell the people that the nations will recognize it. The nations will say, these things are worthless. And they will come to God, and God says in verse 21, the nations will recognize. They will know my power and my might, and they will know that my name is the Lord. Um, that's the picture of what is to come. That is the picture of uh, people from, from all over. Uh, not just the Jews. Um, and as we begin, we, we look ahead in the story. Yes, the people will come back from captivity. They'll be restored to some degree. But what God has in, in view, more than what will happen in the days of Zerubbabel and Joshua and Ezra and Nehemiah. Beyond that, what God looks forward to is a kingdom that will be established, made up of all those from every nation, Jews and of the, the nations, the Gentiles that will give up their idols and will put their trust in the Lord, serve the living God, know him, uh, and, and, and establish in the Messiah a, a covenant relationship with him and be, and be faithful to that. That's what Jeremiah here briefly looks forward to with a, a message of hope in the middle of a, a, a sobering message, not only of the punishment coming on Judah, but even the, the life of, of, of mourning and lamentation that Jeremiah himself has to live as he bears the burden of, of being God's prophet. Okay, that's uh, the end of 16. And so we will quit there. And I uh, went about a minute over, so I apologize for that. Um, but uh, we'll pick up on, I'm going to zoom through this here. And uh, we will pick up in chapter 17 on Sunday. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I hope that was helpful. We'll see you on Sunday for worship at 930.